Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. Love being back here in the saddle. We were actually in New York City, and that is the subject of this particular episode. But before we get into that, I hope all those listeners with their earbuds in right now, I hope you're doing whatever you're doing and you got a smile on your face. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> Tim, you got sort of a half smile on your face right now. My concern level is raised a bit. Are you okay? How are you today? <laughs> I am doing great. I'm excited about this episode. Lance, we visited New York City and the offices of Crime Con to record this episode with Kevin Balf and Elise Powers of CrimeCon. They're kind of like old friends at this point, seeing that we've known them since 2017. This is just a fun conversation. And we mentioned this during our conversation with Kevin and Elise way back in the day when CrimeCon started. We had done a, a recap episode with them and we wanted to keep that going. We wanted to sort of make that a tradition. So after a CrimeCon, a few weeks go by, we visit them and they talk about how the event went if there was anything that could have been done differently, all the things that went well, and we have a couple of laughs, and then we talk about future crime cons, and then we got interrupted by COVID, so that didn't play out the way we wanted to. All that being said, we're back. I didn't realize how much fun it was going to be and how relieved I was that we are back doing these crime con recaps again, so hopefully this is going to be one of many, and it's an excellent conversation, and you get some insight not only into what happened in Vegas, but just the overall planning of an event of this size. The last event in Las Vegas had about 5,000 attendees, so that is a very large event. A lot goes into it. It, it is kind of shocking to hear. So you can check out CrimeCon and what they do at CrimeCon.com. Make sure to follow them on social media as well. And get that hashtag going. And what hashtag am I talking about? You'll understand a little later, but it's hashtag Crawlspace Dingy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, if you want to hear more about that, I'm sure we'll get into it on the uh, Crawlspace Crypt. And that is on our premium feed. You can check that out at crawlspace.supportingcast.fm, where you get our bonus show called the Crawlspace Crypt. You also get every single episode of Crawlspace ad free. And it's all for the price of a cup of coffee per month. Okay, everybody, follow us on social media at Crawlspace Pod or Crawlspace Podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. We're going to cut to commercial right here, and we'll be right back with Kevin and Elise. And we're back with Kevin and Elise. We are here in New York City with Kevin Balf and Elise Powers of CrimeCon. You look thrilled to be here. I'm so happy. <laughs> Elise always loves podcast tapings. It's her thing. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's been so long since we have gotten together post crime con reaching out to see if you guys wanted to do this in the first place. I feel like you've have, uh, you're approaching this with a whole new zest, like a whole new yeah. energy. Yeah, I've been looking to... forward to it all yeah, week. Yeah, clearly have. <laughs> right. We had a little technical difficulties where we were picking up uh, the frequency of uh, some bad radio station. I thought it was at least sabotaging this. I I'll it be honest. I think we all thought that that's what was happening. <laughs> yeah, and she had this smile, and I thought we were going to see like a tape recorder under the table yep. or something. Uh, yep. yep, you guys are going to listen to this later and hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was you singing. Yeah, and you just tried to cause interference. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, this is really fun. Nice to, uh, to see you guys again. Tell us about CrimeCon 2022. How did it go? What's that again? CrimeCon 2022. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's funny after these events, you know, it's, it's you, uh, I think maybe I've obviously never given birth to a child, but I've heard about pregnancy brain where you oh, sort God. of like, you know, it's real bad. And, but then like, you're ready to have another one, you know, and it's like genetically so that the human race survives. I feel like a little bit with that with CrimeCon, we sort of go through a period where all of the hard work and, you know, tough times goes away so that we're ultimately willing to do another one. It was, it was awesome. I mean, we were in Vegas this year, as you guys know, and um, a lot of people who had not left their house for, in some cases, many years uh, came out and I think it was a great weekend. You know, there was, it was, I think we had the best speaker list we've ever had, uh, certainly the most people we've ever had. And tons of energy, uh, maybe too much energy in some cases, yeah. but uh, a lot of energy. Yeah, I thought it was a great way to get back out there after coming off of 2020, which was a you know full virtual postponement. 2021, we were in Austin with a, with a, a half-size event. So this was our chance to really get back out there in a big way. It had been like two years since we had been to a crime con and this one just like knocked our socks off and that it was the most productive crime con we've been to as far as like getting content, which is not the top priority, but it's like the easiest priority for us. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're surrounded by your people. Yeah. But the speakers, 
the people that stand out to me are like David Robinson, whose son Daniel is still missing. Very fresh case. And he was there, you know, literally took time out of a search for his son, understood how important it was to go to CrimeCon and spread the word. Yeah. That's like the thing that I'm talking about when I say that it's the most productive, not just for like content creators, but for people who are right in the middle of it, right, right. in the middle of the reality of what you guys are rep- trying to represent. Yeah, no, we appreciate you saying that. I mean, I, we always often say it on Sunday night after these events, really, we are like firefighters over these weekends. And I'm not, that's not a good thing, right? But like, we're mostly putting out issues. There's this is happening in the ballroom and this person has this problem. So we get very little awareness of what's going on in the event, even though we spent a year plus developing the event. And uh, it's frustrating because these speakers that I have great relationships with and, you know, that we work so hard with before the event, they get there. In a lot of cases, I don't even get to meet them. I mean, that's how crazy it is sort of behind the scenes. So it's great afterwards to hear, you know, the people that were in podcast row and were on stage and and obviously the attendees themselves that they had a great experience and productive is a good word. And uh, yeah, it's really good to hear. So, and we've obviously guys have been to a bunch of them so you can compare and contrast. With growth, there's always gonna come new challenges and, and everything else. But with this platform and you guys know what we're trying to do, just create a platform for the people that are in the thick of this and need help to get the word out and to spread the word. And so. For us, the bigger it gets, the better chance we have of helping them, but it does create logistical challenges and experience challenges. And so those are the things that's our job before Orlando is to work hard on those and, you know, continue to to make even a better experience as it gets larger. What what kind of logistical challenges, I guess, are you speaking about? Oh, I mean, anything, right? So 5,000 people in that space, you're thinking about, okay, all the sessions get out at the same time. You've got people that are trying to get from ballroom two to ballroom one, and it's going to be this big traffic traffic jam in the hallways. Um, You're trying to think about bathroom access for 5,000 people. I don't know if you guys use those bathrooms in Vegas. They were massive security, obviously. And how are people going to, speakers going to get back of house? And, you know, it's just everything. Our first year was Indianapolis, 800 people. It seemed real hard for us because we had never done one. But looking back, it was a very easy logistical event. You know, and now we spend most of our time on, okay, a speaker who's going to come in on noon on Saturday, how are they going to get their badge? They can't get in because we have security right at the front. So now do they call somebody? Do they text somebody and they go meet them? Like just weird things that you're trying to figure out that aren't necessarily additive to the experience. That's our challenge is to get back of how do we get give those logistical issues to our production company so that we can get back to really focusing on the event experience. Yeah, 5,000 people with 5,000 human problems that Correct. could possibly pop up. The details must be like exhausting. And I'm wondering how the two of you like delegate between both of you when it comes to these fire alarms that go off. How do we delegate? Yeah, I think we have a good groove. So we all are forced to wear these walkies. Nothing good happens on the walkies. I mean, uh, right. If if someone's asking for you, it's not good. But it's funny because we have a channel and like a lot of times we'll be in the staff office and you'll hear a call come in and we'll just like look at each other. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, who has to go take this? But um, I think for the most part, we have a pretty good division of responsibilities. Like Elise works a lot on the expo hall and podcasters and uh, exhibitors. And I'm mostly working with speakers and sponsors. At a general level, that's how we break it up. And then right during the conference itself, it's really like all hands on deck. And we've got other support and other staff members as well that, that we've been able to tap. And our, our staff here that all kind of flies in just for these events that really doesn't know what's going on at CrimeCon. We're just like, hey, you need to come to Vegas and go to the help desk. They all jump in and definitely as a team effort. Yeah. And we could use some more team members. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you find that to be the case every year? Wrapped up the events and you're like, here's where we could have used more help? I mean, I always feel like we could, but now Austin didn't feel that way, which was the only event that you guys were in at. Austin was very peaceful. The big biggest challenge was the NFL draft, right? The NFL draft comes in with, depending on what estimates you want to hear, up to a million people directly outside of our hotel on the on the Strip. The NFL does things at a level that is just, you know, beyond almost anyone else. Um, and I've talked to a lot of even like security people who marvel at how much they spend on things. So we knew that from a, from a safety standpoint and those sorts of things, like literally every three-letter agency, federal, state local was was right there outside our door the challenges that it created from transportation all flight prices were way up hotels were real tight in the city and expensive and the number one being staffing anybody who was like a warm body in the las vegas metropolitan area who wanted to work that weekend the nfl took them in and increased all the pay rates so we had a really hard time getting 
frontline just event staff for our event because we were trying to compete with the NFL draft. And I would say for us, that was the biggest logistical issue this year is that at all the volunteers we had, it's not all, but a good percentage of the volunteers we had signed up two days before the event were kind of like, ah, I'm going to go work the draft and get paid instead, which is reasonable, but we lost a lot of volunteers. And so then we had to staff up late. Just those sort of like how the sausages made stuff that's boring, but that was really impactful for us and trying to cover that sort of staffing at the last minute. In fairness, we picked Vegas. Then COVID happens and the NFL draft has to get postponed. So they took our weekend, not vice versa, yeah, but I will us. never in a million years book a city within a hundred <laughs> miles of the NFL draft yeah. again. That's for sure. That was one of the questions that a lot of people had. This is the same weekend as the NFL draft and no one knew you know, who booked first. I think it seemed pretty obvious that because COVID happened and like all of that had to be like shuffled around that if there was another alternative, yeah. it would have been taken. Absolutely. Right. Plus to be honest, the hotels, they could have had their way. They would have loved to have not have us there that weekend because they could sell those hotel rooms at five, six, seven hundred dollars a night versus our room block that had been booked many, many months prior at whatever we were at, 179 or something, right? So they're probably sitting there saying like, I wish these guys would go leave and we're like, we're not leaving. It did give Tim and I one of, one one of the funniest stories that we've ever had at a crime con where we tried to walk back or walk to an area where we could at least like pick up a cab to get back to our Airbnb. We couldn't get to where we could see we needed to get because things were shut down and we walked what we thought was a straight line through Bellagio. the Bellagio. And we came out kind of in this weird half moon. We're like, how did that happen? I thought we were walking in a straight line. And then we realized like we couldn't get a cab at all. We ended up hiring like a limo. It was like this like SUV stretch limo. And we um, managed to get out of there. It's only in Vegas. You get yeah. a limo to take you <laughs> so a we got miles. A good social media post of us in this giant limo. Yeah. And we stopped at Walgreens for some water first. Yeah. <laughs> for him or for you guys? For oh, what a like, guy. We need some water. Could you mind swinging by that Walgreens? And so he pulls in the parking lot and does this like 18 point turn. Going to Walgreens in a limo. <laughs> yeah. In an obnoxious <laughs> SUV stretch limo. So you said that it was boring how you make the sausage. I think a lot of people find it fascinating especially the crime con regulars, because everyone, when they show up, looks around and they're just like, how does all this come together? Yeah. Well, if they figure it out, let us know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What happened in the days leading up to COVID and then having to reschedule Orlando back in March 2020 is obviously when everything went down with COVID. And I mean, it's funny, I, st I still remember being here in the office in, in February, my brother sending the first article of like, have you seen this? Right. And but, you know, as things got more and more serious and everyone started taking it, I was still of the mind really and wrongly, obviously, in retrospect, but that like this was this was just being overblown by everybody. And so when March 13th, I think, was like the critical day, I, I had to be in Orlando for a site visit. And so we go and it was just so weird. I mean, it was at least fly. I was already in Florida. Elise flies down and it was just like kind of a ghost town. We're pretending as though this event's happening. We had everything from our standpoint was locked in. We had a schedule locked. We had everything planned out. So we're kind of going through final prep, but like the thing is in the back of your head saying this, this may not happen. But the sales, the hotel is so invested in wanting these events to happen, right? Because they're making payroll. They've got the chefs and the event planners and the idea that they would lose these events to them seemed impossible. I think it was maybe a week or so later where it just became obvious based on all the, the, the stuff that was coming out that we were gonna have to make a change. At that point, to me, the best change was let's just postpone this to the fall, bet in the summer this dies out, right? And we'll all get back at it. Right, it was supposed to be a two week, one month thing. Yeah, two weeks yeah. to stop the spread. Right, two weeks. Right. But calling the hotel, they were great, but it was definitely like no one wanted to admit from our side or their side or any of the other, of course, I feel so bad for them, the number of events that they were working with at that point in time. So we postponed it to the fall and then we all know what happened. The f <laughs> that was not going to work out. And, uh, you know, they've been great and got us a date in fall of 23, which we were really felt very fortunate to get. Uh, since we already had Vegas booked at that point, that was kind of our first available. And all the events from 20 were attempting to move. So now they're trying to move you know, 40 different events to these future years. It's just, just what a nightmare. And so you already had Vegas booked. So you weren't going to do the Orlando one in 2022. So 23 was the first option and they had nothing in the spring. So we, we took our first fall dates. Very cool. It's a great venue down there. We've been there so many times now for site visits and we're having to start this up again. But have you guys ever been to this property, the World Center Marriott? I don't think yeah. so. Great property, really nice. And really, I think like fans will really, attendees will really like it. The pools areas are incredible, but it's also got like its own little mini supermarket in it. The event space is all single level sort of like Vegas, where very easy to get around once you get the lay of the land. You mentioned David Robinson a few minutes ago, uh, who's who's the father of Daniel Robinson, who's missing. 
How does that presentation come to you guys? It does vary, but in that particular case, we reached out to him. You know, we obviously have seen what he's been doing on social and his passion. That's the exact type of person we're trying to host, right? I mean, we're how do we supplement your efforts? You're obviously have changed your life to to devote it to this search. You know, to me, the interesting story there, like there's obviously unfortunately a lot of missing person stories, and we could program an entire conference of those. To me, the story was him, right? Here's here's a father who refuses to just accept, I don't think that, I don't, that's maybe not the right word, but it refuses to just let this go and wants to be active. And um, I thought the way he's using social, the way he's using in-person searches and flyers, and that to me was the story. And so, yeah, we invited him and he he jumped at it. Yeah, he even relocated to do the, the search and he was close by Vegas. So I think it was a perfect fit. Yeah. You know, I always say what we do on the stage for the hour is one thing and we can have as much or as little impact of that. It's everybody else at CrimeCon, right? So guys like you who have who have podcast titles, maybe you want to talk to them. There's media there that interviews them. And the outflow from that is really where I think we can, you know, hopefully do some good and propel folks into to some of these other areas. Yeah, I saw Mac is actually going to do something with that case too. I think she's doing some DNA testing on that Cheryl car. Yep. Yep. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. David Robinson had messaged us, I want to say the night before or a couple of nights before. And I think he sent some messages to other creators too, and tried to set up additional interviews while the conference was going on while he wasn't on stage. And that was just such a great way for him to take advantage of the opportunity to, to speak with people, to spread the word as far as he could. Very admirable job. And I think he's a great leader in that way. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And he's providing a template for other families. And I think we all, we all realize now that the atmosphere and the environment's changed that, you know, if you're unfortunately a victim or a family of a victim or, you know, related to a case, you do need to take charge. Not to say you're getting in the way of, of anything that's happening on the police side or whatever, but you need to be your own advocate and make sure that you are the squeaky wheel and you are getting the grease. And that's the way the world works. You know, I do feel like the event can help. I mean, even the John Ramsey stuff, right? I mean, it's obviously an extraordinarily well-known case and it's been around a very long time, but even a case like that goes and like no one's no one's talking about it unless there's something to talk about how do you bring things like that back into the headlines and make sure that you know again a family should get justice it's funny you bring up john ramsey because at the very end of everything i think we had just spoken to you we were walking away with a couple of friends who we know through crime con and one of them was like oh that's john ramsey and he was there with his representative we just walked over and we asked him if he would be interested in coming on our show and he was like yeah no one's really asked me to come on a podcast before and we're like really you? Wild. I just think that that's a testament to what we're talking about with the people coming together at this event and someone like John Ramsey, who's been around for decades, for him to be like, I've never been asked to be on a podcast. Yeah. After you just bump into him. Yeah. And you can just bump into him. What were your favorite presentations at this year's Crime Con? I've literally not seen one. I was just going to say, I don't, yeah, I didn't see one session. I sat in the back of a couple. I was there for the beginning of Dateline. I had seen the opening video that they played when they sent it to me for approval prior and it was like incredible. All the mentions of Dateline and pop culture. Uh, so I wanted to see what the crowd reaction to that was. I did watch the entire Ramsey presentation because obviously I was concerned about any um, behavioral issues, you know, any uh, security issues and things like that. I had the unenviable task of being the person in the back of the room at the tech table that would have to make a call you know, should anything happen, whether it's someone standing up and trying to shout Mr. Ramsey down or protesters or someone tries to take the state, whatever the case may be of sort of how do we handle it? And we needed kind of one decision maker. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I enjoyed that presentation because the entire time I was just, you know, if something happens, how am I going to react quickly? Keep everybody safe and informed. And, you know, are we going to end the session? Are we going to pause the session? What are we going to do? Except for the Clue Awards. I was there for the whole Clue Awards because I, Elise allowed me to sit and eat dinner and, and enjoy it. So that was great. I'm not bitter at all. What about you? Did you you guys see any sessions? Yeah, we saw Donna Green speak and we saw David Robinson speak. And then we saw some of the podcast row, the glass box stage there. We saw some presentations there, Crime Door and uh, a few others, Nancy Grace. Yeah, it was great. It did seem a little bit different this year than years past. It seemed a little shorter, the presentations possibly. And also there were more moderators maybe, or, or they spent more time out there, at least in the two that we saw with Donna and David, um, the moderator spoke before they brought on the guest. Yeah, there's a few takeaways that came out of it. We do, as you guys know, we do a pretty extensive survey every year and we, we really take those, you know, 
you can't, you, we do read everything, but you can't take any one individual comment as gospel. When you start to see themes, that's where, you know, it resonates for us. And we obviously try to, to make event changes based on that. You know, one of the things that we're thinking about seriously is going back to a full hour on the presentations. We've adjusted this a lot over the years. We've toyed with a whole bunch of different formats, but I think we've kind of settled on, we like the 20 minutes between sessions. It gives everyone a chance to relax a little bit, get coffee, go to the bathroom, find a new seat. And then to sort of compensate, because it used to be 10 minutes between presentations, we went from 60 minutes to 50 minutes so that we didn't lose speaking blocks. Because when you do out the whole grid, if you go 20 minutes between and hour long, you ultimately end up having less presentations. I think that that's a reasonable thing is like less is more maybe. And as long as they're like, give them a little bit more time to breathe and give people time to breathe between them. Even if we lose a few over the course of the weekend, the ones you're in will feel a little bit uh, more impactful. Yeah, I'm definitely nodding when you're saying that because it didn't feel as much of a whirlwind as it usually is felt when you show up for CrimeCon as like the in the capacity that we show up where you set up and then it's like people, 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 session, 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 people. And then on Sunday, you're just like, what happened? I mean, there was a lot going on, but it did feel like I can take a breath here. Yeah. And we had time to interview uh, David Robinson, like literally in the hall at, in between sessions. Yeah. So we had time to think about those things and do do those things, which again comes back to like it being a very productive weekend because it didn't feel like it was just nonstop. I don't know if there's a perfect answer, but we'll, and some of it's the venue, you know, I mean, uh, Orlando, it, it is a very large space, but it is one floor and you'll be able to get around easy, you know, 15 minutes might work. There was obviously still COVID concerns this year and you wanted to make sure that people could, could have ample time for cleaning or going to wash their hands or grabbing a mask. Yeah, or I was going to say the, the first year that we did the 20 minute breaks was Austin and it was for COVID because we wanted to spread people out yeah. and have time to clean and everything. And then everyone loved the 20 minutes. So. But I think in, Indy was like, I think it was 50 minute sessions with 10 minute breaks. Nashville, I think we went to an hour. New Orleans, we might have gone back down. So it's been all over the place. The thing is, we spend so much time making sure the sessions are going to be good, right? Who are the right speakers and the right people on stage? You know, the presentation's good and our team works specifically. We can't change the presentation, but we try to help the speaker make the presentation as good as possible. When you do that much work on it, then if you want Q&A at the end and say that's 15 minutes, if it's a 50 minute session, right? You're really down to like a 35 minute presentation. And to your point of a moderator is introing them, 30 minutes is not a long time when you have someone really interesting doing like a presentation on a case file. I like the idea of, of a little bit longer and, and see how that kind of goes. I wasn't initially a fan of how Podcast Row was set up with the glass box stage being where the podcasters did their live shows. And I was really nervous when we were about to do our first one because I thought that all of the activity I thought was going to take away from that and it totally didn't and i totally did a 180 the second anyone on our panel opened their mouth and you could hear it and you could see people sitting there and you could see people buzzing around so there's this energy beyond it people could hear you and then people that were walking by they would pop in they would start listening then other people would start coming in and it was a lot better than when you're doing one of these events and you know you're going away to this like breakout room. You know, you might get like 15 people trickling in or 30 people trickling in and you kind of lose like an energy when you're just in this closed box and you start thinking to yourself like, well, what else are they at right now? I'm glad that that's the way it felt in the room because I think if anyone listening has ever been to like a professional conference, uh, American Academy of XYZ, you know from the conference organizer's perspective and from the business model, that expo hall, the key thing is how do you get people into this expo hall? We have less of that problem because people are honestly interested not only in the podcasters, but in the in the, the book publishers and the media companies, et cetera, et cetera. So we've always had good flow in there. But I think the idea that you're going to put programming in the expo hall. And so the people that are coming in for programming are then providing this energy for the room. And then after the programming, they probably mill around. Like, I think it just works well. And we, you know, we're going to make a few changes in terms of uh, acoustics and, and sound overflow and stuff. But I think we really like the idea of a stage in there. So Glassbox is sort of the new company representing podcasters. They're representing us. And it was their first time at our suggestion to uh, contact you folks and see what they could do to represent. What's your take? I'm going to let Elise handle this because as, as you guys know, Elise has a very high bar for liking people that we work with. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think it. I can wrap it up in two words, which is great guys. Okay. They're awesome. great guys. Yeah, they're great to work with. Uh, I think they're really happy with the sponsorship and hopefully they'll be in Orlando. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. What does the future hold for CrimeCon? Sleep. No, I don't. <laughs> <Never>. Sleep. <laughs> Sleep. Um, 
So the next thing for us, we launched the Clue Awards this year. That was like the big new initiative for Vegas. And that was a, you know, planting a flag and saying, hey, there needs to be some recognition of the creators in this community, the podcasters, docs, books, TV. No one's focused specifically on true crime, right? You can be up for an award in a, in a, in a category that's maybe parallel. But the reaction we got from that, from the creators and the media companies and everybody else was was super positive. We got a, a lot of nominations in. Uh, we got a, a, a really world-class judging panel, I felt. And then the show itself, it was a first year show, but I think by and large, the reviews on the show were were very positive. People felt like that emotional connection when the Black and Missing Foundation came up at the end and told their story and played their video. I mean, there was, you know, literal tears. To answer the question, that's one thing that we want to continue to expand out and grow and, you know, hopefully turn it into a, a really a marquee award show. As CrimeCon's grown, the more and more of the business side is happening there. Producers are there, networks are there, pods are there, folks like Glassbox are there, right? And so, we're all dealing with the same stuff, the same issues regarding everything from distribution to advertisers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of learning, I think, that can happen from the creator community and the business community at CrimeCon that we're not formalizing right now. Right now it's happening in in you know bar conversations and stuff. So I'd love to expand that out and really how do we help the creator side meet each other, network better, answer these questions that we're all dealing with in terms of respect and ethics and and all of those sort of things that are, are central to everything that we do. So to me, that's another key piece in the growth. And then I think event wise, you know, we did our first crime cruise in 2021. We have our second one coming up in 2023. The inaugural one was was obviously, uh, <laughs> to call it impacted by COVID would be an understatement, <laughs> but was influenced by COVID. I think it's a really fun balance to, to the land-based crime con in that we've got 5,000 people plus in this conference center for a weekend. Crime Cruise, even if you go to Crime Con, Crime Con sits along with it because it's a much, much smaller group, way more intimate with the speakers. It's a much smaller speaker roster. And then you've, you're have you combining, you know, more of the fun elements, mur- murder mystery games and, you know, bingo and trivia and those sorts of things, not to mention an awesome cruise ship and ports of call and all that stuff. So I like the idea of growing that to the point where we sort of are a two event a year um, schedule. I've never been to an event on a cruise ship, but I have been on cruises and I've seen people with their badges and lanyards. And I was like, oh, how fun is this? You get to go to an event and you get a vacation out of it. And a lot of the logistical things we deal with, food, um, staffing, security, AV, on a cruise ship, it's all there, right? So from our standpoint, we get to focus on what we want to focus on, which is programming. So we get to pick the best speakers, work with them on on the presentations and the cases. Unlike a crime con, when you've got a group of people that you know is going to be there for four straight days in all of these sessions, you can do a single case and follow it through. So you can really do deep deeper dives into some of this stuff. At night, we all have these group dinners and everyone's in the piano bar. And, you know, it's a fun community. Like I felt on that first crime cruise, the sense of community there was really, really strong. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know. Are you making fun of it? No, yeah, not okay. at all. You want to go because you want the crawl space. <laughs> I, was, I, I was getting to <laughs> the crawl space crime dinghy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think uh, we're gonna have to put this out to the to the to the masses and have them petition crime con <laughs> to okay. have the crawl space dinghy. Just you know, in a nutshell, for those who are listening, uh, it would be Tim and I rowing <laughs> guests yeah. who have uh, probably VIP level. Badge. <laughs> yeah, the, v- the, the VIPs definitely want to be my... rowed in a dinghy out to the big ship. By two guys who don't they, have a lot of experience. They might not even know. Ocean. Yeah, they're not going to make it. I think my other question, just visually, we need to maybe maybe see if someone needs to Photoshop this for us, but. If you look at a cruise ship, you board on like level it's five. Like seven or eight your level, rowboat, yeah. Is, yeah. there's nowhere to get. I don't know where someone's boarding. Yeah. There would be a rope. It'd be oh, like a rope they climb the ladder. Like I would have to stand there with the rope. I'll be on the boat and I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah. that's what we were thinking. It's, it's hard yeah. for me to see that as the VIP though. If you're, if you're, Maybe it's non VIP. You, you gotta like climb a rope to get. <laughs> Your perk of VIP is that you can board regularly. <laughs> it might go the other way and it's below the standard badge. <laughs> yeah. Now I think. You I think so we talking. have to introduce a new badge type. Yeah. It's the yeah. pirate badge. It's the dinghy badge. Oh. Yeah. yeah. The pirate badge. Yeah. Yeah. So you, for 30 bucks, you can risk your life to get up. <laughs> it's good. And we'll, we can dress up like pirates too. You guys chose yeah. the wrong what careers. Would that be? This yeah. is, you guys should be doing event planning. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was definitely not making fun of it. I just like the uh, idea of the dinghy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great idea. Maybe it's an excursion. So, you know, when we pull up into Cozumel, a certain group who's who's uh, chosen this specifically so that there's not lawsuits gets into the rowboats and you guys roam around. Or it could be people that 
you don't really want in crime con uh, and then we kind of just get lost during, lost at sea lost Whoa. at sea there's yep. no one we don't want at crime con come <laughs> on <laughs> well speaking of that i had a question about security when you're planning these crime centric events if it's the crowd solve the cruise or crime con itself where do you start with security just talking to people a lot of them express not surprise but they're always like it's interesting that you're at an event that's about crime and nothing ever happens. Well, in some ways, you'd have to be pretty dumb to go to crime. You know, in some ways, I feel like it's a real safe environment because what would be the point of going to CrimeCon to commit an actual crime? I mean, everybody's there. Actual working detectives and FBI, and not let alone our security, but just the people who are there, right? I mean, it's almost like what they always talk about with big threat events and the Super Bowl and everything else, right? Like, if you were going to do something, there's a lot easier ways to, to, to do something. That said, obviously, I can't discuss the specific security stuff, but obviously, it's always on our mind in terms of, you know, not only protecting specific talent who might have a, a, a specific instance where there's, you know, people who have made threats against them or, or whatever, but yeah, fans in general. I mean, the, to be honest, the stuff that's usually that we spend the most time thinking about and dealing with is more of the run of the mill disruptors. Luckily, maybe not lucky for people who are listening, but we're, we, as, as you guys all know, it's a fairly high priced event. You know, it's not, this isn't a cheap ticket. And I hate to say it this way, but in a lot of cases, there's there's some disruptors who are just like, they would normally go if it was $19, but eh, it's a little too expensive for me to go disrupt. Someone's got to buy a ticket, be willing to come in, obviously be willing to be thrown out and potentially arrested once they do their disruption. But I think that's where we spend a lot of our time is, hey, how do we, I don't care if someone disrupts it, as long as we take care of it professionally, responsibly, and don't impact the experience for everybody else who's trying to enjoy it. Also, as we talked about, like John Ramsey, we just talked about, and obviously that's no secret, that was one that was on my mind in terms of, of disruptors. You know, the thought occurs that it's gonna be a self-policing audience in a lot of ways. So let's say that we're all sitting there watching John. By and large, 99% of people who come are respectful and uh, passionate and enthusiastic and whether or not they agree with the speaker, they're they're there to hear and to listen and to be educated. And I think if you stood up with a sign and started yelling, the first thing that would happen is that everybody around you would start yelling at you to sit down. You know, and I, I feel really good about the crowd that we've cultivated that they'll, they'll be the first line of just defense for sort of that side of, a, of an issue, a disruptor issue. And then obviously we've got our protocols beyond that. What about crowd solve? At least you haven't spoken in a while. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. We get asked about it a lot. They're really hard to put together, not from just an event planning perspective, but from a finding a case that is not, we have never wanted these to be BS. Yeah. A real case that has a real chance of being solved, a real high solvability factor, a police department that is willing to open up the case file and, and say, help. Uh, a family that is willing to say, we're in for whatever you guys need. This, you know, these, the, these are challenging. Yeah. I think it would be more if we're presented with the right case that would trigger us to to want to do one. Right now we're doing on Crime HQ, we're having fun spending a lot of time in a cold case club, which is like a very mini crowd solve. So we've got a case in there right now that's playing out over a number of weeks. And we do a similar thing. We bring in the experts and the detectives and the family um, and attendees engage over Zoom and we provide case file information, et cetera. Yeah, in terms of an in-person event, obviously COVID derailed it. I mean, remember our last one was February, 2021, a month before everything blew up in a 2020, sorry, in Chicago. That was the one that Selena Gomez came to with her mom. And yeah. Selena's w wearing a mask in February. And it was kind of like blowing my mind. Like, what does she know and everything? And then, I, mean, I don't know, she got tipped off or something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she was on it. She she knew even at that point. Selena Gomez, was she there in preparation for only murders in the building? She says no. Really? Well, yeah. That this was, uh, I've spoken, her mom is lovely. I've spoken to her at length and you know, this was a, this was a girl's trip. This was a mom daughter trip. You know, now knowing what we know that she was doing the show, maybe I'm not sure what prep would have come on it other than maybe her seeing how other sort of citizen detectives, I will also say, I mean, I, I met Selena. She, she was very gracious, but she was also very into it. Yeah. I mean, she had her notebook and she was, you know, she was as into it as anybody else. So I, I tend to believe, yeah, this was a vacation. And Selena's mom came to Austin, I think. And she was sharing like pictures on social of uh, like composites and everything. She's very into it. Yeah, and she's a producer of her own right in Hollywood. She did um, 13 Reasons Why. Oh, okay. okay. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was it was fun to have them and fun to watch the recognit like the lack of recognition for the first couple of days and then the sort of like word started getting out. I think that's Selena Gomez. I think that we were obviously concerned, right? So we pushed it as far as we could until it became clear that uh, that she was there. But <laughs> the only person wearing a mask was Selena Gomez. <laughs> yeah. 
is uh, Steve Martin and Martin Short going to be in Orlando? Yeah. <laughs> um, guys we'll we need a season three probably. <laughs> yeah. that to happen. Are you guys watching the show? I love it. Yeah, it's, it's a so great good. show. It's so good. Yeah, it's, it's a great good. show. My only question is when are you planning on going to Boston? Don't get me started. It's my number one choice. You know, I love, I'm a Boston <laughs> guy. I, we've been up and down on the venues there. We can't, can't find something. So none of the hotels are large enough. Ah, uh, right. And really? the uh, Heinz Convention Center is in the midst of a big sort of transformation. Yeah. Basically, the only hotels we can fit in now are Las Vegas, Orlando, and Gaylord Properties, which are built for for these size of events. So we're really sort of, you know, again, not to uh, give you too much inside baseball, we're struggling with, uh, it's a good problem to have, but how do you maintain the experience we want to maintain when you're when we're limited by these venues? And obviously the answer is go to a convention center. But if you guys have been to events at convention centers, you know it's very different. You know, you're, you're in a sort of a soulless, big warehouse type building. It's not the ballrooms that we all like. And for events that aren't like, expo driven their their stage and programming driven i've always struggled with how to make that work in the convention center world thank you guys very much yeah really thanks for coming it. in yeah. letting us invade your space again anytime when we started it and then you know we got two in and then covid and then or three in and then covid and we always wanted to make a plan to come here yeah. with you know a few months or weeks after just to do a little recap just love the idea of doing that we so love it great to be back to do that we'll see you guys on the dinghy <laughs> <laughs> you said it you <laughs> Thank you.